This week on CrossFeed. Books behaving badly. Financial faith. Prophesying pastor in prison. Religious rights repressed. Buddha of the bees. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Howdy out there in podcast land. I'm Pastor Jim Butler of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. So y'all ready for Thanksgiving? How do you get so big to do food of this kind? No. <laughs> got the sermon ready. Got the service ready. Wife's job to get the food ready. Ah. Uh, see, we're... Uh, we're going to be hopping in the car and going to visit family. So, you know, we have never visited family for Thanksgiving. We've always lived too far away. Yeah, I suppose we're um, remarkably close. So, no, I take it back. Our when we were in vicarage. Second year we were married, we went to her aunt's house for Thanksgiving. But we've never spent it with with my parents or her parents. We've always lived too far away. So you just spend it with your immediate family then? Generally, um, when I was at seminary one year, a couple years, you know, we had a whole bunch of us who couldn't go home over. But um, otherwise, it's just been us. Uh, A couple times when we were at our first church, there was another couple who couldn't ever get back. Um, I can't remember where they lived, but, um, we would have them come over to the house and, uh, our, yeah. And then we would, we'd spend it and share it with them. But since we moved out here, it's been pretty much just us, but this year it's just going to be, um, the four of us, uh, hmm. since, uh, the oldest two are gone. Um, and, uh, so it'll just be the four of us. And, uh, we're even talking about just doing Cornish game hens or something. That works. Done that before. So, so enjoy yourself going over the, you know, valley and through the woods to Grandma's house there. <laughs> My background's breaking up a little bit. I'm going to real quickly reset the background here. I'm waiting! Yeah, that looks better. Let's get going. Where do you want to begin tonight? Um... Well, let's start out with this book, The Shack. Oh, The Shack. Um, now, I got into this because one of my... Have you read it? No. <laughs> no, okay. One of my members did, and so she brought it into me. And I had actually read about it on the American Lutheran Publicity Bureau boards and um, another email list I'm on. Uh, just to give you a real quick... I don't know if you know much about it at all, if you've even heard about it. Mm-mm. Um it, Deals with this guy. His name is um, was by the name Mac, and he had a daughter who was killed in a, in the shack by um, a kidnapper. She was kidnapped. He had taken his children out uh, camping, and his youngest daughter was kidnapped by this guy and killed in the shack. And he's got two other children. And so this is about three years later, and he gets this note from. Um, Signed, I haven't seen you in a while. I want to talk to you. Signed, Papa. And Papa is what his wife calls God. And the, um, and Papa, God, wants to meet him at the shack where his daughter was killed. So, um, he goes back, he thinks this is crazy, but he feels really like, I need to do this. And so he goes out there. And miraculously, when he gets arrives, that the shack is transformed into this beautiful home. Middle of winter, it suddenly becomes spring outside. And God appears as a big black woman, um, who they call Papa. Jesus appears, as you'd expect, blue jeans and a flannel shirt, and you know, with a carpenter shop. And the Holy Spirit is a Asian woman, Sarah Yu, I believe is her name, which is spirit and some... Asian language. Uh, the idea of God the Father being a woman, there's two aspects to that. Number one is, I'm neither male nor female, really. 
You know, I'm just number two. You need to see me. You you need to break out of your stereotypes. But uh, you know, and 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 see me in a different way. Uh, earlier, he thought I always pictured God as a you know like, looking like Gandalf with a long white beard, and you know, so uh, Papa says, you know, if I was Gandalf with a long white beard, wouldn't I just like what you expect me to be? You know, but I never, I'm not what people expect. You know, I'm, I'm different. Uh, at one point, it's kind of interesting. He says, well, which one of you is really God? And I'll open and say, we are. You know, each no, of us is fully no. God. No, he would say, I am. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe they said that. I can't remember that. But, but the idea is, you know, each, each claiming to be fully God. Uh-huh. Uh, like I said, very, very, there, there's places in the book where it, it seems to be universal, teaching universalism, but then he turns around and kind of does not teach universalism. Um, I don't think it's very well written. Matter of fact, you know, I read it in about eight hours. I thought it was rather trite. I thought it was rather thin in, in, in his writing style. Uh, it doesn't refer to scripture very much, which uh, upsets me. But it's, it's extremely popular, and uh, anyhow, so this review that we that we uh, pulled up here for today uh, that I found, um, you it's know, it's not. Herald. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Even from your area out there, I mean, um, I love this. So this it makes me uh, nostalgic for the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> So here's the, um, he, he mentions a uh, few examples of what this quirky trinity teaches Mac about God. All right, first of all, God has no expectations of man. Man has no responsibilities. However, Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. So this reviewer is sort of showing how this guy is contradicting scripture. Right. Although... To that extent, you know, I'm trying to remember the, the point that was being made. It's just like, I, if I remember that section, it's, I'm not expecting you to you're work your way to me. You can't work your way to me. The, the rules, nobody can keep them. I don't really have expectations of you because you can't do it. I mean, in a way, we could even say that. God really doesn't have any expectations of us. He's done it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. No. And, and he, and I mean, he really has... Uh, no expectations of us because he knows that we're, you know, born spiritually dead. And that anything right. that we do is, you know, is, it's by his grace that we're even able to do it. Absolutely. Um, God will not punish people for sin because sin is its own punishment. Um, right. There, I think the point he was making was it's, um, not that God, it's not like God is sitting up there going, you know, you know, sitting on this, this throne judging us. It's this is the consequence of your choice. You know, that, that, that we were created to be in relationship with God in our desire for independence. We broke that relationship with God. And now God's judgment is it's not that God, is, yeah, you know, God's judgment is. The natural consequence of our choice. Okay. Does that make sense? In a, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it, this is you know we talk about natural law and um, earthly consequences to sin and, and <laughs> things like that. You know, it's when the pastor goes to the prison and says, "Well, you're forgiven. You know, you repented of your sin. God forgives you, but you still have to serve out your sentence." Right. But even even this even goes a little bit further than that. I mean, even talking eternally. Basically, God is saying, look, you don't want to have a relationship with me now. When you're on earth, you want to do your own thing? Fine. Will you die? That's what's going to happen. You'll find out what that really means. Okay. You won't like it, but you'll find out what it really means. Okay. It's, you know, so it's this, not really you know, a, a, it, This is an antinomianism then? No. No, okay. it's not antinomianism, but... but yeah, you know, as I picked up, that's his understanding of 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 you know the way the way it is. It's it's not that there's no judgment; it's that it's more. This is the natural consequence of what you've done. Okay. You want? And I, and I, and I mean, I've told people, you know, 
It's real simple. You, you know, if you don't want to have a relationship with God now, then when you, I've even told people that. It's not so much that you know, God does judge us, but the idea is that when, when you die, you've said all your life, I don't want anything to do with you, God. I want to do my own thing. I want to go my own damn way. And God says, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, just to clarify for our uh, listeners, antinomianism is uh, something that was popular even during New Testament times. And it was the idea that, well, you know, if, if God likes to forgive our sins, then we should sin a lot and, um, you know, to give him more opportunities to sin. And it's where uh, St. Paul says, well, should we, you know, sin so that grace may abound? Certainly not. And um, right. so, okay. Um, so I heard several people comment that Christians shouldn't get our feathers ruffled over this book because it is, after all, a work of fiction. However, this particular work of fiction includes an end-page appeal to help broaden the distribution of the book so that others will get, quote, a magnificent glimpse into the nature of God that is not often presented in our culture. Right. And that's where I, I, I looked at that and I just shook my head and go, well, I guess that's, you know, it's Almost as good as L. Ron Hubbard setting people out there to, uh, you know, buy his book so he, you know, would be a bestseller. Um, I, yeah, that, that I thought was really kind of a, a, a strange thing. Um, and again, you know, there wasn't much real scripture in it. And there were places where he, he does seem to become universal, teach universalism. Which is to teach that, you know, basically all roads lead to God. Uh, that uh, you can't, you know, as long as you're in some sort of relationship with God, uh, then that's, that's all that counts. And I didn't see a real strong thing about, you know, it's only, although then they'll turn around and say, you know, a hint that this is really only through Jesus that, that you have this real relationship with God. Well, uh, is it more in the really sense of, of, um, now I know some of his other stuff sounds, uh, contrary to Roman Catholic theology, but um, kind of, I mean, Roman Catholic definition of grace, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but this is what I I gathered from the uh, Roman Catholic Catechism, and that is that grace is God gives you the ability to do good works to earn your way to heaven, in in essence. Uh, it's It's a little more complex than that, but that's kind of the gist of it. And so, you know, kind of what I said before about we can only do good works by God's grace, they say, yeah, and that's what you got to do. You got to do those good works, and that's and it's ultimately it's those works that save you. But it's God's grace that saves you because He's the one that gives you the ability to do those good works. And we say, no, the good works are purely the good works are the product of your salvation. That because you're saved, this is how you respond to that salvation. But you're already saved before you ever do your first good work. All right. You know, it's um. Like I said, I, I, I really spent a long time trying to figure out if this book is orthodox or heretical. Um, I have read both, I've read comments on both sides. I have read people who think that's perfectly, perfectly orthodox and it's a, just an interesting view of God. Uh, you know, just kind of a way to maybe take, take bringing you out of your normal understanding of what God is like. Um, others have said this book is absolutely, like this author, this reviewer, the book's absolutely heretical. Um, and, no, and, and I, you know, and I don't know, maybe this is a minor point, but I would definitely disagree with, um, with using, with calling God female. And we've talked to, on the show and, or, you know, or, or even genderless, you know, God has chosen to describe himself, um, using masculine terms for a reason. And I know people argue, well, like wisdom he uses that and, and that's a feminine noun, but. You know, even their wisdom, it's, that's more of a, um, just because of the Hebrew language that the word wisdom is feminine. Um, well, the same thing with spirit. Uh, ruach in Hebrew is, is spirit, is feminine. Right. But I wouldn't, but the, but the, in the New Testament, it's, it's a neuter term. But interesting, although it's a neuter term, it's always used with male adjectives. But anyway, mm -hmm. interestingly, well, uh, um, at one point, Papa changes from female to male. There's a scene, one of his big issues was uh, a problem he had with his father. And there's this scene of him reconciling with his father as his father is actually in a hospital having this dream and he enters his father's dream and, you know, reconciles with his father. And then after that, he's able to see God as father. 
okay. but his understanding of, of, of a father got in his way. Well, it sounds like he, so, he's uh, trying to take some, um, some metaphors, but he, he just kind of took them a little too far. So you're right. Um, it did. Yeah. Would I recommend it? No. I would recommend pastors to read it simply because your people probably are reading it. Um, or a lot of other people have, or something, I mean, get it for Christmas this year. Uh, I saw it the other day for sale at Target. Uh, so I would, uh, you know, really recommend, you know, for pastors to read it just to be aware of it. I, I, I think there's some stuff you can maybe pull out of there for sermons. You know, some, 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 you know, aspects and things. Uh, so. Well, I don't recommend I, I the book I, The Shack. There, there's this interesting illustration in it. <laughs> yeah. What I would, or something else that you know, so you can stand up and say, yeah, I was reading this book and it's absolutely heretical, and this is you know one area where you know you really need to stay away from. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I just there's there's probably there there is some wheat among the chaff, but there's a lot of chaff. <laughs> Um, although I don't know if you ever have you ever had a member who struggled with calling God Father? No. Okay, I've had some women who've been sec- or sexually abused as children by their fathers, uh, and have a hard time. I had one girl who um, parents were divorced, dad lived, you know, a thousand miles away. No, fifteen hundred miles away. He was in yeah, she was in Denver. Dad was in on uh, like in South Carolina or something like that, and. You know, so dad was somebody, you know, you talk to on the phone now and then and got a check every, got a check every now and then in the mail from. You know, she, she had no real conception of what a father was. So, well, uh, I mean, my, and, and, you know, I, I haven't had this happen, you know, for me, but my thought is that in a situation like that, you'd talk about how, well, yeah, you know, that's the problem with earthly fathers is they fall short of the ideal, but God's the ideal. Or how did you handle it? No, I am your father. Yeah, I kind of went that direction, you know, talking about, you know, it didn't really highlight the idea, too. It's, it's, this is not how we talk about God. It's not God talk. This is how God has chosen to reveal himself. And that, you know... God really is a loving father, but I think I might even want with you know more of the gender neutral term and call that a parent and his parental love um, but trying to bring the people to a point of healing mm-hmm. where they can see God as a loving father but that's one of the one of the aspects i you know and I found this 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 idea of god as 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 a african American woman to be rather bizarre. There was a, what was a Muppet Family Christmas or something like that. Uh, it was basically uh, the Muppets do It's a Wonderful Life. And uh, in that one, Whoopi Goldberg played God. And they were in trouble. And I was, that was like the one Muppet movie. I even liked Muppets from Space, uh, mainly because I'm a big Gonzo fan and really emphasize Gonzo. Um but that was the one Muppet movie that I really don't like and do not have in my collection and am not interested in having in my collection. Well, I tell you. But here's the question. If a bunch of people were really in favor of this book and wanted to put a monument of a shack up in a park, <laughs> would they have to do it? <laughs> Good transition. Hey, we try. (laughs) All right, so this is in Pleasant Grove City, Utah. There's a park that has a monument of the Ten Commandments in it. It's a public park. And so there's a New Age group called the Church of Sumum. Or some of them. Or some of them. Or some of them. (laughs) Not all of them. (laughs) Just some of them. (laughs) Sorry. Um, 
they want to put a monument with their seven principles of creation um, called the Seven Aphorisms near Ten Commandments Monument. Um, I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. So the question is, well, there's this religious monument. It's dedicated to a fraternal order. It's not, which, you know, I'm thinking, Knights Columbus. Um, but... It no, the say. Fraternal Order of Eagles. Oh, it's the Eagles? Oh. All right, I missed that. The Eagles, yeah, they, they put these up all over. Oh, okay. So they, um, you know, they want to put this up. They say, look, you got this one representing religion. The thing is, Ten Commandments don't represent a particular religion um, because the at least Christians and Jews and kind of sort of Muslims um, will subscribe to them to some degree. And, but the, not to mention Mormons and, you know, a lot of other sort of quasi Christian groups. They say, well, you know, you've got this religious monument up there. You got to allow us to put ours up there too. Now, of course, you see the problem with this because as soon as they do that, then, you know, along come the, um, the Wiccans that want a pentacle monument put up and the flying spaghetti monster people that want a big noodly appendage. And, you know, and, and pretty soon you can't get around the park. It looks like a big giant museum. Well, I, I like some of the, 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 the questions from the, the, um, the justices. We have a statue of Liberty. Do we have to have a statue of despotism? What about a monument to chocolate chip cookies? Yeah, or does every president that wants his face on Mount Rushmore, uh, do we have to put him up there? Or? Yeah, you know, or on the government National Mall, we have a uh, you know a, a memorial to troops who died in Vietnam. Do we have to have a memorial to people who opposed it also allowed in the National Monument? See, National Mall. See, that's that's this is where, and I think it's you know going to be the question is um, who can decide you know that a monument is permitted. Because if they allow and say the seven aphorisms here have to be put up there, then you know, you know, people are going to come along and start demanding a monument any place they want. Yep. And under what? And and then won't have you know, you know, they won't have any power really to say no. And so uh, I, I I believe very strongly that this is. I think it's going to be a unanimous decision turning it turning it down because uh saying that the state um, and the government have the right to refuse monuments and say no you can't put this here if they really want to have their monument to the seven aphorisms go buy your own piece of property and put them up that's what the first amendment says Mm-hmm. You know, as a friend of mine likes to say, the First Amendment is freedom of the press, which means if you've got a press, you're free to put, print whatever you want. It doesn't mean anybody else has to print what you want. Yep. Yep, no, that's a good point. So the question is, though, by choosing one monument over another, are they promoting a particular religion? We don't serve their kind here. And therefore establishing a government religion. Well, I don't think so because they're permitting the, um, you know, the fraternal order of eagles to put it up. They're not permitting somebody else to put something else up. But there's, you know, I don't think it's promoting necessarily promoting anything. It's saying we're, but but we we have the right to decide what can and can't go into a public park. I imagine some of this just has to do with now. This is um, this is in Utah. And, um, and I, I think to some degree it's going to depend on your community. You know, I mean, if this was San Francisco, you wouldn't be putting up a monument to the Ten Commandments. It just wouldn't fly there. You know, it would, it would not fit into community standards. Uh, maybe, maybe not. These, um, the Fraternal Order of Eagles, as I recall, did a lot of this like in the 1950s. So all these monuments have been around for a while. Yeah, if they're already uh, there, that's a little different. Right. So, but it could be just the opposite. It could be, you know, people, you know, it could be, you know, 
they, they, you know, always can remove it too. There's nothing stopping the government from saying, eh, oh, this really isn't community standards anymore. It's going now. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, this, I mean, I guess it seems that it's up to the individual community. Now, the big argument is always that, well, all right, you know, there's the community majority rule and that kind of thing, but at the same time, you know, what if the community wants to put up a, you know, a monument to the KKK or something like that, you know, where even if the community's behind it, but it oppresses a particular group of people, you know, that's a whole nother issue. And, um, so, you know, I, I would say that you couldn't, no matter how, you know, even if you've got a community where, um, everybody but three people are part of the KKK, you still, um, you know, couldn't put up a, some kind of statue like that or a, a big swastika or something like that. Hmm. So, but that's uh, it'll be an interesting case. But I think it's going to go down. And I mean, there are those who would say neither monument should be there. But um, <clears throat> considering, I think that you know, so many, you know, I would say the vast majority of religions in America uh, would understand the tenets of the Ten Commandments. Uh, agree with them. Matter of fact, the vast majority of religions in the world would hold to, you know, what we call the second table of the law, you know, commandment, you know, uh, uh, loving your parents, not killing, not committing adultery, not lying, uh, you know, not coveting. I mean, those are basic moral principles that, you know, it's kind of hard to disagree with. Yeah. Although, I don't know, nowadays, it seems like committing adultery is. You start telling people they can't do that, and they go, why not? So <laughs> it seems like that one's becoming less and less of uh, uh, something that would work with most community standards. Sadly. I mean, very sadly, because it's, it's really going to destroy our society, and we're already heading in that direction. But Of course, now, what they could always do if they wanted to, the, the, the guys that summon, they could always just, you know, tell them that, you know, the God of some of them will condemn them all if they don't get to put it up. Mm, yep, strike them down. Strike them down, which brings us to uh, this uh, pastor, a um, guy from Michigan by the name of Ed, Edward Pinky. Pinkney. Pinkney. Before we go any further, if anybody, because last time we picked on a uh, a little uh, um, fringe religion. Their founder contacted us and got mad at us. All right. So before we go any further, uh, I'm sorry about the 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 making fun of the name thing. That was juvenile, and and I, I I'm sorry about that. No offense was intended there. I disagree with the teachings of the group, um, and I'd be happy to debate uh, that or whatever, discuss that. Um, but sorry about the name calling. Anyway, let's get back to Edward Pinkney. Oh, gosh, you've just been so politically correct, I'll tell you. Anyway, um, now it's interesting. In 2007, he was convicted of paying people to vote in an election, you know, which is... Um, <laughs> a crime. <laughs> a crime. But uh, the ACLU said uh, that it, um, you know, his, um, you know, free, free speech... Uh, uh, um, rights were, were trampled on. But anyway, um, uh, <laughs> well, the, the ACLU is so not defending him for, for that. He, uh, I mean, he already served for that, but now he's on probation. Right. Anyway, but he wrote an article for the Chicago newspaper called the People's Tribune saying that the judge who handled his case could Okay. Now, could be punished by God with curses, fever, and extreme burning unless he repented. I wonder if he met the author, the shack, who says there's no such thing as repentance. Um, maybe they can get together for a good weekend there and, you know, sing Kumbaya a few times and maybe they feel good, real good. Um, anyway, so um, um, a judge then... Um, 
send him to prison for three to ten years, saying he violated his probation by making a threat against the judge. Yeah. So, um, the, you know, there's, there's two sides to this. Uh, the, uh, the, the judge who, who put him in prison said, those are words that would put the fear of God into anybody as a threat that this could happen to them if they do not do what Mr. Pinkney wants them to do, whatever that might be. In other words, what are you saying? You know, I mean, it sounds kind of like, a, uh, I mean, it sounds like a threat. You know, boy, it'd be a real shame if all of a sudden your house burned down or you, you know, <laughs> or, or it'd be a real shame if all of a sudden you got exposed to anthrax, which is sorry we're not doing about that. The Mormons and the, it wasn't anthrax, it was just, but they got mailed some, um, white powder. Just, uh, anyway, uh, to our knowledge, uh, this, and this is the ACLU, uh, lawyer or legal director, Michael Steinberg. To our knowledge, this case marks the first time in modern history that a preacher has been in prison for predicting what God might do. <laughs> God might do this to you. <laughs> Lock him away. You know. So, and notice he, he did say modern history because like Elijah, um, Jeremiah, you know, <laughs> um, John the Baptist. I don't think, uh, uh, Pastor Pinckney here is, you know, quite there with Elijah. Well, no, no, I, I didn't want to put them in the same thing. <laughs> but I would say that they're, you know, I, to me, his words read like a threat. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, they could easily, well, or could easily be interpreted as one. You know, God might cause this kind of thing to happen to you. Um, I guess my, my next question would be: Is that a threat? You know, and I mean, it, it is. I mean, it sounds like it. You know, he's making a threat that this is, you know, this, the, you know, on a scale of one to ten, yeah, this is likely God's going to do this to you. Uh, you know, you don't. I don't care who you are. It just seems to me you don't write things like that in a, you know, in a newspaper. Uh, you know, calling down God's, like, like I don't know. Especially on the, the other details. Hand, have, yeah. On the other hand, we do have the imprecatory psalms. Maybe he should say, "Happy is the man who dashes your head against the dashes the you know the your infant's heads against the rocks." There you go. <laughs> You know, there's certain parts of the Bible that I really wish that God had worded differently. <laughs> like, dude, come on, you're making this difficult on me here. <laughs> now that that's, by the way, for you guys, you know, it's from Psalm 137, and it was written by the the, the Jews post exile from Babylon, and so they called God cursed down upon the Babylonians. Yeah, you'll notice that that one's not part of the, you know, sort of regular lectionary cycle. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I think it'd be great to chant that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, don't ask me what's with these worship people. That should be part, that should be a, an entrance psalm for one morning. I, I think it'd be great. Hey, I'll tell you, the, the past few weeks with the, the Old Testament lessons have all been, you know, this God calling down judgment, all it's all that end of the church here kind of stuff, and uh, man, it's harsh. <laughs> like, almost want to preach on all of them just to to say, all right, let's put this in the context of you know we're talking about repentance here, and you know. But anyway, back to sorry. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe just you know, maybe he should have said, "Let justice roll down like waters." You know, he could have said, yeah, "This is the Bible verse I'm saying here." Right. You know, I'm saying, I'm right. saying the Bible here. You know, then, then probably, would have, you know, I'm not, well, how do you argue against the guy quoting the Bible? Well, um, yeah, but when he, when he's really specific, you know, the other thing is, you know, if he said, you know, God's going to punish you, that would be one thing. But when he says, you know, uh, fever and extreme burning, you know, like, um, what do you have in mind? Can you be more specific? And, you know, can we keep you out of uh, hardware stores? Right. You know, yeah, but but obviously the idea of turning the other cheek and um, you know make your your, your make it, have a defense with with gentleness and uh, respect. Um, uh, not to mention the fact that what's he doing? He's he's threatening or, or calling down curses on this guy 
Why? Because he put him in jail. Why? Because he committed a crime. <laughs> you know, he was completely outside of his rights. He was completely outside of of not only his um not only the the, the laws of the land, uh, but the Bible. There's nothing all in the Bible about buying votes for you know. I mean, I'm sorry, that's just wrong. That's sin. The guy that should be repenting is this Pinckney, not c calling the judge to repent for doing his God, you know, called job. He's doing his, his vocation there. That's the word I'm looking for. Are you incapable of restraining yourself, or do you take pride in being an insufferable know-it-all? So, I'm sorry, but, you know, to me, the guy sounds a little bit off his rocker, so I'd be pretty uh, concerned if somebody started saying that God was going to do those things to me, because next I'd be sort of expecting the follow-up to be, and I am his instrument. Yes, but, you know, I, I can't think of a transition. You know, I'm trying to think of that. We had two, new, two other stories, but, oh, well, let's talk about Buddha and the bees. Maybe God's going to call down bees. On person, mm -hmm. or uh, did wasps, you have to talk with your, your kids yet about the the, the Buddha and the bees? <laughs> <laughs> you know, normally we don't do. I mean, the, you know, there's been a million stories, and we always post them um, to to CrossfeedNews dot com because I think they're always kind of fun and interesting, and and you know, you've got Jesus and the grilled cheese, and Jesus in the doggy door, and you know, and all that kind of stuff, and. And, you know, generally we don't talk about them on the show because it's just one more Jesus sighting. Every once in a while we'll do one, but, um, this one I picked for the show. And the reason I did is because it, you know, a lot of times people see these pictures. Oh, I saw a picture of Jesus in my ultrasound. And so that, you know, assures me that my baby's okay and, and whatever. Okay, so what does it mean to you as a Christian then when a Buddhist temple has a wasp nest on the in the eaves that looks like Buddha? You know, if it's a spiritual thing to have something that could also be Jerry Garcia, um, but you say, oh, this is Jesus. Okay, then is this also Buddha then? And of course, you know, Buddha never claimed divinity or anything like that, but you know, what does this mean? Oh, you are so Lutheran. What does this mean? <laughs> oh, very nice brain. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, to me, I go, well, it's just a, you know, kind of goofy coincidence. And, but you know, if you look at it, <laughs> yeah, it does look kind of look like Buddha. <laughs> So an entomologist said wow. that uh, it's just, it's oddly shaped nests. It's probably four different nests that were formed over several years. Yeah, my my view is that it's an um, oddly shaped nest, and that kind of looks like a bunch of things. And if you look at it quite right, you know, it looks kind of like looking in the clouds, you know. What does it, what's, what's, what's it look like, you know? And, mm -hmm. and I always remember um, there's a great penis cartoon on that, and he said, that looks like, the stoning of Stephen, and I can see St. Paul over there holding holding his, the cloaks. And and then Lucy says, well, what about you, Charlie Brown? What do you see? Well, I was going to say a ducky and a horsey, but I think I'll keep my mouth shut now. <laughs> <laughs> they all look like dragons to me, so. You know. So anyway, they, you know, be careful what you say around dragons. For you are crunchy. It tastes good with ketchup. <laughs> okay. My daughter used to have her okay. bumper sticker for our, her car. Oh, I love that one. I used to have a pin that said, um, the light at the end of the tunnel may be an oncoming dragon. Um, now, if, if you look uh, at it, um, here's what I think it looks like. I think it looks like a sort of um, Monty Pythonized... Uh, Easter Island statue. See, if you, if you take the top as sort of the, the top of the head, and then there's sort of this dark spot that could be the eye, 
and then um, kind of curving down to the left looks like a nose, and then the bottom part looks kind of like a chin. And then the, the sort mm-hmm. of lump on the back uh, just looks like long hair, like it's like a guy wearing a headband. It does look like Jesus. Actually, more like Moses, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, it looks a little, it's a little blurry just because of the low bandwidth uh, problems that we have. Um, so what I'll do, I'll, I'll grab the picture and I'll put it, for those watching the video, um, I'll, I'll put it in the, during the sort of closing credit outro music. And, um, and so you can take a good look at it. And then you can email us, take a good long look at it, and tell us what do you think it looks like. All right. And we've got one more story to do. But, um, you know, if you want to just pause right now, podcast at crossfeednews.com, uh, or if you're uh, watching this on one of the video sh- um, sharing sites, uh, just leave a comment below. What does it look like to you? Our own Roshark test. Cool. <laughs> I think it looks like a dollar sign. No, no, sorry. I don't see it. Okay, a stack of coins. All the little holes, you know, little coins, all stacked up. Okay, yeah. I can see that. So we're waiting for Scrooge McDuck to dive into it. <laughs> mm-hmm. 99 bottles of beer on the wall. Anyway... Brings us up to our last story, then. I'm trying to think of some sort of transition to this. <laughs> about churches. And every once in a while we talk about, you know, different outreach things churches are doing. And actually I've known a couple other, a couple Lutheran churches. Actually, my own congregation, I'd like to do this. Um, and that is in, in these really troubled times, several churches are, are doing outreaches by doing financial seminars in their, in their churches. Um, looking at biblical principles, uh, in terms of money. Now, the one that we particularly are highlighting tonight is uh, by those wonderful people at Willow Creek uh, and what they call Good Sense Ministry uh, in in this and um, helping people get out of debt, helping people understand, uh, you know, some good financial principles in terms of, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, developing to get out of debt, developing and, and giving. I mean, this is all part of stewardship. Yeah. You know, that was you know, the thing. You know, I, I saw this in my my first, my gut reaction was, oh, man, you know, why don't you get back to the Bible and that? But then, you know, I, I read it and I thought about it like, oh, this is just stewardship. This is personal stewardship, you know. Mm-hmm. So The one that we're going to be doing at our, uh, at St. Luke's um, sometime in this, this next year is called uh, Financial Peace University uh, by David Ramsey. Uh, and actually, it's interesting because a friend of mine did it in his church and had great success with it. Uh, had uh, ten people from his church and ten people from outside the church take the course. <laughs> and then I just talked to another pastor who's done it a couple times at his congregation. And he just absolutely loves it. But yeah, this is basic stewardship. You know, we see we always we're doing stewardship in my church right now, and we often think of stewardship as giving money to the church. You know, the old three T's: time, talents, and treasures. Which is which is good as far as it goes, but I've always argued stewardship is much broader. Mm-hmm. Stewardship mm-hmm. is learning to be a good consumer. Stewardship is learning to be to handle debt properly or not at all. Uh, stewardship is um, uh, taking care of what we do have, doing the right maintenance. I mean, it doesn't do any good to you know get a new car. And then, you know, do, you know, never change the oil. I mean, stewardship is you take care of what you have. You are a steward, a manager of things that God gives us. And that's really what this is all about. It's all about the whole idea of stewardship, being stewards of what God has given us. Oh, I heard this great thing this week. Uh, I was listening to another podcast. Uh, it's called The Six. Um, and it's done by a, another Missouri Center pastor. His name is Dion Garrett. And, uh, right now he is in, um, he's in Michigan. Uh, but he just accepted a call down to um, St. Louis area. But anyway, um, he was talking about his, his daughter um, made this uh, this thing for this uh, craft project for him and, and gave it to him. And then she's, you know, she goes in later on, a couple days later, and she takes it and she says, you know, mine. And he goes, no, oh, but you gave it to me. Now it's mine. And he says, once you give somebody something, then it's no longer yours. It belongs to the person you gave it to. And she says, 
then how come you keep telling me that all of the stuff that God has given me isn't really mine, it's really his? <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. <laughs> That's right. Um, but, you know, I just think it's it's it's... We live in a world, I mean, so many people right now, you know, really got themselves into some real binds financially. I don't know if you've dealt with people, you know, thousands and thousands in debt, um, just... Been there. Been there. Yep. Um, got uh, got one of those services, the, those nonprofit services to help out, um, and managed to get ourselves out of it, but it took us about mm, six years or so. You know, with credit cards, you you get to college and here you go, you know, and it's a big hole you can dig yourself into real quickly without realizing it. So, and, and yeah, all this stuff about the, the housing and, and everything else and, and just the, the way that our, our, um, society says spend, 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 you know, and so people do and, you know, it's, there was a. I think it was a podcast I was listening to. Anyway, they were talking about that stimulus package, you know, a while back. And, uh, mm-hmm. they said, okay, so who's, what's, what, okay, so I'm, I'm supposed to take this money and, you know, and sock it away so I've got it, um, you know, when things get bad. No, 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 you're supposed to spend it right away. Oh, so who says I'm supposed to spend it right away? Oh, well, you know, the people that are always saying save your money and be, you know, be frugal with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, it, you know, what are you going to do? There's, it's, it's about finding a healthy balance. You know, um, on the one hand, God doesn't expect that, you know, there's, there's the story of the rich young ruler where, uh, Jesus, you know, he says, what do I have to do to etern- inherit eternal life? Jesus says, follow the 10 commandments, you know, and, and he says, oh, I've done it. And, and so, um, so Jesus says, oh, you have, huh? How's the first one doing? Give up everything you have and, uh, you know, sell it, sell everything, give it to the poor. And the guy goes away sad. And the point wasn't that he could save himself. The point was, no, you know, you haven't kept it. You haven't even kept the first one. And, um, so, um, so we're not called on to give up everything we have, you know, um, God gives us things that we can use for, um, you know, for his glory. And, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with, you know, spending things on ourselves for our own personal enjoyment. Um, but you know, it's, it's finding a balance of how much am I spending on myself compared to how much I'm spending to help others. And, you know, and it becomes a, you know, kind of a faith question. But, you know, there's a point here that, um, you know, some pastors are uncomfortable discussing money because they don't want to appear self-serving. All right, give money to the church so I can get a raise, you know. And and so it's really hard because you want to talk about um, stewardship in, in all areas of life. And that does include giving to the church, all right? It includes giving to other ministries, too. It includes giving to, you know... The Red Cross, for that matter, the American Cancer Society, or, you know, any number of different things. Last week we talked about, you know, giving to somebody who whose house burned down, you know, which, by the way, they actually, after two days, closed that down because there was such an overwhelming um, amount of, of money coming in from people that after two days they said, all right, got enough. We don't need any more. Thank you. If you'd still like to give, here's a link to go and donate to the American Red Cross to help out other victims. Um, but so, you know, he's taken care of until all this stuff goes through. So that was pretty cool. But yeah, the, I mean, and the point is that, and it's not just giving to charity, you know, it's like Jim's talking about taking care of the things that you have because those are God's things. And, um, and he gives them to us as a gift, but you know, we want to take care of them. And um, see, what I tell people though is, too, when it comes to giving, they need to give. They really do. I, I, I've even told my people, if if we had a, a three million dollars sitting in the bank, you would still need to give. 
you you know we we you know <laughs> it's just what God commands of us to give Him a portion of what we return. And I'm a born again tither, so it's uh, I'm really I'm one of the really scary people. I started tithing two years ago, and it has just turned my life around doing it. It really has changed how I look at a lot of things in my life, and so I I encourage tithing in my church very strongly. Uh, because of that, and I've, I've told my own people, uh, I used to hate to preach on stewardship, and, I, and because I wasn't very good at it. My own stewardship was bad, and I said I hated to stand up there and, and talk about it because I knew the financial secretary was going, he's talking about tithing, what a hypocrite, he's not doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I said I have to set the example, so I, I've, I've shared that with my people a couple times. So I would, you know, strongly encourage good stewardship it's very important but and i think it's as for us i think this is all just an aspect of this and i think it's i think it's very good for us um to be teaching this in our church and then teaching it outside to people who just need to know how can i get a hold of my finances because the money just can the, you know the money can rule us the money can be you know really can, Luther and listen, at the large catechism say it says that, you know, money is the most common God out there. Yeah. Of all the yeah. false idols, money is the, the most common. Well, I said in my sermon Sunday, you know, um we we still worship gods of metal and wood. They just happen to have pictures of dead presidents on them. You know. Um so Jesus said the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money is, but the love of it. Um, because it can be used is you know, a root of all evil. Is there no? And that wasn't said. No, uh, definite article. No, and that wasn't said by Jesus. That was said by Saint Paul. I did not know that. Okay. Okay. So just two. I thought it was in two different places. Nope, it's only in um, Timothy, I believe. Okay. So. Well, God, say God said it. God said it. I absolutely agree. But maybe you guys know another place where it says it in the Bible. Maybe I'm wrong. Wouldn't be the first time I'm wrong often. Just ask my wife. Let us know. Crossfeed at uh, 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 See, podcast just, at crossfeednews.com. See, I still think, I still think crossfeed at gmail.com. Yeah, that's you know, what you know, that one still pops up. I'm old. I'm almost 50, okay? Two more years, I'm 50, so, you know. Yep. Old that and also cranky. Means older and wiser than he is. Anyway, more I'll, more I'll, 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 maybe you think I'm, maybe you think I'm, maybe I'll be saying senile here. Okay, I'll take that comment, too, at <laughs> podcast at crossfeednews.com. Uh, we haven't gotten any good emails from anybody for a while, so so please let us know. Uh, just I mean, some I'm cranky just people on YouTube. Too. Yeah, cranky people on YouTube. But those guys, they don't like us very much. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, I, I hope I, you I, all. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say I, I posted in that that whole thread. Um, I, I posted a link to the to our follow up story, hoping that they would go and watch. But I, don't, I haven't gotten any follow up comments, so we'll see. I was going to say, um, I do pray God would give you all a blessed Thanksgiving holiday next week. I uh, hope you have a good time with family and friends and football. And we will see you then after Thanksgiving. Yep, yep. So don't be looking for a, a Black Friday episode or anything like that, you know. Um, we're going to be spending time with family. So, um, but, but that Sunday night we'll probably be recording. And um, so it should be probably the Monday or so after Thanksgiving, uh, we'll have an episode out. And so, yeah, um, you know, take some time, spend time. Think about, uh, I was, I was telling Jim before we started recording, uh, my sermon for Thanksgiving. Um, I don't even mention giving thanks in the actual sermon. Um, but I just talk about how great God is. And so spend some time thinking about how great God is. And you know what? You'll, just just thinking about it, you can't help but give thanks. And uh, just, you know, I was talking on Sunday how, how thankful we can be that God is who he is, that he's not um, a God who has all these expectations and, boy, you better live up to it or you're going to hell. And, you know, that we that God is the God who 
uh, came to be one of us to pay for our sins and give us eternal life. Man, that's something to be thankful for. Amen. So, take care. God bless you all. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless.